Today we're going to focus on the last component of the circulatory system called the immune system. And what I want you to think about with this part is the immune system is really similar to, an analogy would be similar to a, a, like a castle. Um, with our bodies, we've got, you know, little openings and places where things could get inside of our body that maybe aren't supposed to get inside. Things like bacteria and viruses that we call pathogens. And we've got a number of ways of keeping these things out. So, for example, with this castle wall here, we've got the wall itself to keep things out. We might have, you know, some, some military guys up top here that are firing arrows down on top of the invaders trying to get in. We've got doorways to prevent things from coming inside. We've got the moat that surrounds the castle and even a little drawbridge here that can prevent things that aren't supposed to get inside the castle walls, keep them on the out. Now, if things were to break through the castle walls, then we have military inside. We would have, you know, knights and the army on the inside that would be able to fight off any of those invaders. So we call that the, the first line of defense. That would be your walls, that would be like the moat surrounding, okay, the, the part that prevents things from getting in in the first place. And that would be comparable to maybe our skin or um, uh, certain secretions that we have that are on our, our body surface and hairs and wax and those types of things. And then once things get to the inside, once things break through the first line of defense, then we would have our military. That would be, for us, that would be our white blood cells. So here are a couple of examples, some other purposes of our immune response and how the immune response keeps things to the outside. Our skin provides that protective barrier to prevent viruses and bacteria from getting into our circulatory system, getting inside of us where it can cause disease. We have sweat and some oily secretions, so I mean oily skin. Those types of things are typically acidic and that helps to limit the bacterial growth. We have a whole bunch of barriers to help defend openings. So we have eyelashes, we have tears, <clears throat> tears that form. We have, I know it's kind of gross, we got hair in our nose and hairs in our ears. Those prevent bacteria from uh, getting into some of the cells that line those tissues. And then even in um, you know parts of our digestive system, if you ate a hot dog that had some bacteria on it, We've got an acidic environment in the stomach where the acid would probably kill off a majority of that bacteria so that we wouldn't get sick. And then finally, as I mentioned, we've got those white blood cells that will kill those pathogens if they happen to make it through that first line of defense. Now, there are a few disease-causing organisms, disease-carrying organisms, and we would call those things vectors. Probably the most common one would be your mosquitoes. Um, in the past, with the plague, we had the flu. So these are going to be organisms that they don't necessarily get infected with a virus that causes them to die, but they're able to then pass that disease on to other organisms. So in the case of malaria, for example, you can see regions that are affected by malaria. The mosquito gets infected by the malaria pathogen. And then when the mosquito bites people, that malaria pathogen goes into the people's circulatory system and the pathogen infects our red blood cells, growing and multiplying inside of the red blood cells until they burst. And then that person is going to experience some you know, weakness, tired, fatigue, because they're going to have a lack of red blood cells. So the malaria itself isn't the vector. It's the organism. It's the mosquito that carries the malaria, paras or malaria pathogen that, uh, that acts as the vector. Now, some other things here, just some terminology here, antiseptic, antiseptic. Prior to the 1800s or in the 1800s and earlier, um, uh, physicians didn't really use all that you know, sanitary methods when they would be doing surgeries. Um, you would be doing, you know, they would be doing a surgery on one person and then immediately after would use their same instruments to do surgery on another person. They didn't understand that bacteria and viruses were spread that way because microscopy was still a, a fairly new, fairly developing science. They couldn't see a lot of the small, especially viruses in the 1800s because the microscopes weren't, weren't good enough. So antiseptics were things and things we use nowadays that help to inhibit or prevent the growth of microorganisms, bacteria, and are used now to help prevent the spread of infection. These are just some sizes of different types of cells. So for example, your typical animal, typical plant cells would be built like this. And the organisms that we're talking about that cause disease, bacterial cells, smaller than an animal, virus, really, really tiny guys, 
and then fungus spores, things that cause stuff like athlete's foot. Here's just a couple different examples. You're not responsible for these on a test. We wouldn't ask you about protozoans and fungi, etc. But just knowing that these things are pathogens that cause disease. This is one of those red blood cells that I was talking about that gets infected with the malaria pathogen, the malaria protozoan. And you can see how it's all kind of deformed. It's probably pretty close to bursting here. And then those malaria protozoans would be able to go on and infect other red blood cells. <clears throat> There's a lovely one here showing athlete's foot caused by a fungus, fungi. They'll feed off the dead organisms, your dead skin cells, in between your toes and cause this sort of nasty sort of blistering open sores on the uh, in between your toes, on your feet primarily. Bacteria are a real common uh, source of infection. Big, big issue with bacteria is they reproduce really quick. Okay, their, their doubling size is very fast. So while they might not grow into mass numbers, you know, right away, it's when we get into like the five, six, seven hundred bacteria. And if they're doubling every two minutes, those numbers start to increase really rapidly. Now, it's not the bacteria itself that infect and make you sick. It's some of the toxins that they produce. Bacteria, it's kind of like they, they have their own space. You know, it's just like us. We don't like people getting in our space. And we might do things to prevent people from getting in our space. Bacteria do things like produce toxins. And that keeps other bacteria away so that they can eat their food and reproduce and, you know, do things that the bacteria need to do. Now, what makes us sick then are the toxins. The same toxins that they produced to keep other bacteria away, those make us sick. Here's just that uh, exponential growth. I was talking about with bacteria, how their doubling time causes their numbers to increase really, really rapidly. Viruses are another common pathogen. And again, the issue with viruses is not that they produce any kind of toxins, but these guys actually go inside of our cells, inside of our host cells, they call them. And then the host cell, your body cell that they infect, gets taken over so that it, all it does now is produce virus particles. So if, let's say, you had a, I don't know, a skin cell, and that skin cell was responsible for producing like mucus secretions and oily secretions and whatever, then when a virus infects it, it no longer does what it's supposed to be doing, what its primary function is. It gets taken over, and now all it does is it starts producing more viral particles. So here's an image that kind of shows a virus infecting a host cell. A little bit of its genetic information goes into the cell. That cell stops doing what it is normally meant to do, and all it does is it spends all of its time replicating, making new viral particles. Those particles will assemble. And eventually, because this cell just gets so worn out, it doesn't take care of itself anymore. It's committed 100% to focusing on making new virus particles. Eventually, the cell will just burst open, and each one of these can then go on back to this stage here and infect another cell. Now, this is an important part of this section, this immune response. And this is a picture taken from your textbook. Really good illustration that shows the parts of the immune response, the stages of the immune response some terminology like antigens and antibodies, you are responsible for those. And you're also going to be responsible for words like macrophage, helper T cell, memory cells, and so on, and their order in the immune response. Now this animation, which is found on YouTube, does a really good job of showing how the immune response works. And what these guys are will be the little pathogens over here. So these could be the bacteria, these could be a virus, whatever. And you notice we get endocytosis, where that pathogen gets brought to the inside. I'm just going to pause it for a second. Got brought to the inside by endocytosis, where part of this cell membrane wrapped around where that little pathogen was. It engulfed it, and it broke it up into its little component parts. Now, these would be parts that we call antigens. And each bacteria, each virus, has some antigen parts on it. And those are like, um, we can call them protein markers. They're these... Like, almost like fingerprints that are on the surface of all cells that sort of designate those cells as being of a certain type. Okay, So it breaks it up into its components, and then what it does is it takes those antigens and it presses that pathogen's antigens onto the surface of its own cell, onto the surface of this macrophage. So you can see these antigens start popping up all over the surface of that macrophage that ate it. So now we would call this an antigen-presenting cell. Now, other cells that we call helper T cells, 
will recognize that this cell has been infected. They're able to notice those antigens that were on the surface. And as soon as the two match up, they start communicating with each other. The helper T cells produce a chemical messenger. You don't need to know this name, interleukin-2. But it's almost like setting off an alarm in the immune system, saying that the body is under attack. Those chemical messengers will float around the entire circulatory system. And the two main types of cells that detect these chemical messengers would be these guys that we call killer T cells or cytotoxic T cells and another group of cells that we call the B cells. Now this is where the, the immune system is going to kind of fork and we're going to go in two different directions. The cytotoxic T cells are responsible for one function, the, killer, the, uh, the, the B cells do a different function. Now this could be, let's say, a, a cell that's been infected, okay? any cell that's been infected by a virus. It'll start to express those antigens on its surface. A cytotoxic T cell that has been sort of activated because of that interleukin chemical that was released in that last stage will recognize that this cell has been infected because of the antigens on the surface and it'll release chemicals that cause that cell to kind of auto destroy. So it'll destroy that cell on contact so it doesn't have a chance to spread the disease. Now if we go the other way with the B cells, when the helper T cells message the B cells or communicate with the B cells, it starts them multiplying over and over and over again. And what these B cells produce, if you notice, they have these things called antibodies. So that's the role of a B cell. They produce antibodies. Antibodies are little Y-shaped proteins. And if I could kind of zoom in on the end of this antibody, it would have a, a shape that was complementary to the antigen. So if you can imagine almost like a lock fitting into a key, they would match up with each other perfectly. Those antibodies start flooding the circulatory system. And what they're going to do is when they come into contact with a pathogen, they're going to latch on to the antigen that's on the surface of the pathogen. That pathogen isn't going to be able to replicate anymore. It won't be able to cause infection anymore when it's tagged with one of these antibodies. And then those macrophages, they'll be able to come along and gobble up those pathogens a little more slowly. They can kind of take their time now and, uh, and get those numbers under control. Now, something that these B cells can do that's really important for future infections is these guys will replicate each other after the infection is over and they'll produce what's called memory B cells. And memory cells can stick around in the body for weeks, months, in some cases even years after an infection. And the whole point of them is once the body has been infected a first time, these will stick around in the body after that first infection. So if you get exposed to the virus or the pathogen a second time, the same virus a second time, these B cells will automatically be able to start to produce antibodies. And you either won't get sick or you might you know, get you know 24 hour flu or you might get a little sick, a little fever, but you won't be as sick as you were the first time. So that's the basics about the immune response. Make sure you know the difference between an antigen and an antibody. Those are your antibodies again. Make sure you know all of the parts of the immune response, the macrophage, the helper T cells, the B cells, the memory T, sorry, memory B cells, the killer T cells, and we even have a suppressor cell that's not put in here. They haven't shown it in this. A suppressor cell is something that would slow the immune response down once the infection was kind of under control and the body could sort of go back to normal. But those are the big things that we like to see and test on the diploma exam. So make sure you know those parts really well before we get to our unit and our diploma exam.